Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm, Gina Col I'm Gina Colarco with Covance, and we're really excited to bring this workshop to you all today um, with the theme of COVID-19 and specifically looking at and receiving feedback from you about clinical trial participation um, during this pandemic time. So I'll be your moderator today. Get these slides going. Here's our quick agenda. We'll do brief introductions, some objectives and logistics of this workshop, and then dive into some questions that we're looking for your feedback on. So as I said, I'm Gina Calarco. I'm a pediatric nurse and I've been involved with clinical research for over 15 years now at various um, positions and um, pathways. I started out as a nurse in the neonatal ICU and went into a private practice that did a lot of research and worked as a study coordinator and nurse coordinator there. Um, I also did coordination at a large children's hospital, managing inpatient and outpatient clinical trials at Children's Mercy, actually here in Kansas City, and also did various other roles in clinical research, including monitoring the data where I traveled every week to different cities and sites, looking over the data they were collecting for the trial. And I worked on managing global projects. So where I work from home and I get, I work with a team all over the world to look at the data, collect the data, get the sites and investigators educated and interested in the trial work, and then bring that trial and the data in to hopefully um, an approved new drug. Um, all of this has pretty much been within the pediatric clinical trial space, and I've, I've really enjoyed my work and the diversity it's brought me from being a bedside nurse all the way to working from home and managing um, these complex trials. And I'll lastly say I'm mom to a proud mom of two little girls, Eleanor and Juniper, and Eleanor actually made my beautiful crown today. So <laughs> I'll pass it over to my colleague, Deborah to introduce herself. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gina. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here today. Uh, my name is Deborah Gerlach, and I am with the Patient Recruitment and Engagement Team. And what that means is when we have studies, I get to come in and put some strategies together. How do we find the patients? How do we educate the patients? How do we keep them involved in the study and, and have their voice heard? Um, I have been working in pediatric global studies now probably about 10 years. Um, I really love this space. Uh, it's a great area to be in. There's just so much that, that we can do to help um, in many, many different diseases. Um, my journey is a little bit different than Gina's. Uh, I started out, I have a, a graduate degree in experimental psychology, and what that means is I love research. And so for the first five years out of graduate school, I actually worked um, at the University of Pittsburgh, and I did some uh, behavioral medicine research there. So I met with patients, I ran some studies, um, I got to, to meet a lot of different people and do a lot of different research. Um, it was a little bit more academic in that I ran protocols and um, wrote some papers. And then I took some time off to be a mom. And um, when I moved back to North Carolina, I moved to North Carolina, which is where I am based right now, just outside of Raleigh. Uh, I started to work at a large clinical research organization, and that's where I became a little bit more involved in uh, patient recruitment and engagement. I love it. Um, I get to work with people all over the world. Um, it is a global com company, um, and that's where I got involved with pediatric research and actually where I met Gina. So um, we since switched different areas, but um, it's been a, a fun ride and really interesting. Um, and when I am not working, I am also a mom uh, to my children. They're, I'm in the bottom left there. Uh, Jacob is actually starting his sophomore year at the University of North Carolina. 
And my daughter is going to be a senior in high school this year. So she's just getting ready to start that. So it's been an interesting um, past few months, particularly with COVID. I have enjoyed having both of them home with me because I know that they're safe. Um, my son does go back in a couple of weeks with a lot of new rules. And my daughter has decided to um, do some online schooling. So it'll definitely be a different environment. But I love having them around, and he's really close. So I'll pass it over to Paula. Thank you, Deb. So uh, happy crazy hat day Thursday to everybody. Um, very excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a, a while. And um, just want to take a few minutes to introduce myself as well. So I work on the same team as Gina, so our rare disease and pediatrics team. And I've actually been in clinical research over 20 years. And I stopped saying exactly how many years because it makes me feel really old. <laughs> so um, so suffice to say, 20 plus years, but I started out my career at a local pediatric hospital here in um, Columbus, Ohio, and spent about 17 years there where I had the absolute pleasure of running the uh, CRC, the Clinical Research Center. Um, and there we did a lot of, obviously, pediatric work, but a lot of rare disease work as well. So anything from our gene therapy to our infectious disease unit, um, and it was it was an environment that I never knew about until I took the job that I did, but I would never leave. It is a passion of mine. Absolutely love what I do. Um, here at Covance, you know, as Gina said, we do a lot of work to bring um, not only the research trials out to you all, but also the next best medical care. Our goal is to get things approved uh, efficiently, quickly, and in a quality way. But I think one of the biggest roles that we have that I really love is I consider myself to be a liaison from you all in the community to our sponsors and even to regulatory agencies like the FDA. We're there to translate your voice into a voice that can be heard in our protocol design in um, how to support uh, children and their families. So we often say family-centric care um, how do we make sure that you get the very best of what you need in order to support you to be participants in clinical trial work? So it's a very fun space. Sometimes it can be challenging. It's also extremely exciting because we get to see what's next. Um, and I, I try and explain that to people, and sometimes they just kind of look at me and go, wow, you know, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, so really, really just a fantastic space to be in. And, and like Deb and Gina, I'm also a mom. Um, I'm in the middle there with my daughter, Chloe, who has the blue hair. She's super excited about blue hair, like, like the best thing ever for her. Um, she's also a very artistic personality, as well as myself. Um, believe it or not, my first degree was actually in art education. Um, so we spend a lot of time together creating and, and doing work here. I do murals. She does a lot of um, original character work, uh, that type of thing. And we actually made the hat that I'm wearing for a Mad Hatter Halloween costume last year. So I thought it would be fun to wear the hat and share just a little bit of the work that we've done together. So, so thank you again for having us. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, now that we've told you guys a little bit about us, we're hoping in the chat box to kind of get some engagement from you all. Um, just, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing. It could be your name, initials, your age, where are you from? Um, as Deb said, we're a very global community in our company, and we really would love to see where you all are coming from so that when we start to go through our chat today and um, really look at the, the objectives, that we understand a global perspective. So it, it's really important to us. So if you take a few moments, just and as a little, chat. Yeah, as a ahead, little yeah. treat, we have we do have yeah. little raffle giveaways. So we'll be looking at responses to our questions yeah. following our session and awarding yeah. some Amazon gift cards. Yeah. Yeah. So we thought that would be a nice way to say thank you to you yeah. all because um, really what we're doing, if we can go to the next slide, Gina, I'll, I'll just highlight our objectives. So really this is all about you guys right this is about learning and figuring out some next steps for us to help really continue to move us forward so you saw the title of our talk was distancing from COVID-19 and it really is our focus so 
we'd like to really talk and discuss your perspective related to a variety of topics um, kind of around the safety and healthcare practices that you've experienced so far, but also um, looking at how we can best prepare for continuation. Um, those of you that are in the U.S. may be seeing, or even globally, you're noticing that we're seeing a spike in our cases right now. So how do we keep handling this to support the, not only the health, but the, the mental well-being of everybody? Like, how do we balance all this? So your, your feedback is super important here. Um, and then also what's really interesting to us is the impact on clinical trial participation. So as we walk through our questions, you'll kind of see um, where we're headed in that kind of arena. Um, but again, this is all about you. So we would love to have um, your feedback and the way that we are actually um, formatting everything if we go on to the next slide. Yeah, and I just want to say we've had some responses in the chat, too. So <laughs> Maya's in your hometown, Paula, Columbus. Awesome. She's eight, and I have some Kansas City representation, too. And I think uh, for Deb, you have, I, I think you have um, roots in Ohio, and am I wrong, with Chicago, too, maybe? We have participants yeah. from all over. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Gina. I, I am so happy to have you reading the chat, because with my bifocals, I'm struggling a little bit to read both screens, <laughs> so I appreciate the help. So no for all of you out there that have not read it's fun. Um, yeah. So <laughs> something to look forward to. Um, and Maya, so glad to see someone else in our area. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a real fun place to be. Um, so our workshop logistics, we really have designed this very similar to the trivia session earlier this morning with polling questions to kind of drive an initial um, feedback around the question, but then we have some follow-up questions that we'll be asking in person where we'd like you just to um, add some commentary in the chat, and that's where Gina is going to pop in and help us and, and let us know, um, you know, what feedback we're getting. And then our ultimate intent is to do very, or I won't say very detailed, but a more detailed follow-up survey with, with you all as a group um, to get some more insight into, again, how can we further um, kind of support during COVID and what are the important practices, you know, that, that we should put in place and things like that. So, so if we're ready to go to the first question. All right. So I know that this will take a minute for you all to, to pop up on the screen. So essentially what we're looking at in this first question is patient safety. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to back up. We're, we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, COVID and how we approach patient safety. So my apologies there. Um, one of the really interesting things about coronavirus when it first started to hit was that it was somewhat delayed for us. So it started, you know, in, in countries where it was not as predominant and then all of a sudden you started to see this big spike. You know, you, you could see the global impact and the spread. So the most important thing that COVID was looking at was how do we protect our patients? That was really critical for us. How are we going to look at, you know, how things are impacted? And, and one of the very first um, things that we looked at was looking at a, establishing a hub, a central location where information could be shared. Because we are global and there are so many people at Covant and so many clients involved and so many sites involved, we really needed a place where we could come together, see things real time and strategize together. The second piece of the plan was our what's called a business continuity plan. And if you haven't heard of what a business continuity plan is, basically it's whenever some kind of event, like an emergency, a natural disaster happens, we can roll out a plan that's very organized to figure out what we need to do, how we need to do it, and then track it and make sure that things happen appropriately like they're supposed to. So you can imagine there was a lot that went on in this in the background. So just to give you an idea of what we were looking at. Um, we activated our mission control center, which I think is kind of cool. It reminds me of NASA. Um, but we have active real-time tracking for our trials and looking at the risks that we identified. So we have over 5,000 sites in 68 countries with 330 trials. So you can imagine how many patients that is, how many study drugs that is, um, how many labs we had to process, and, and how we get from point A to point B. And if countries aren't allowed to ship, how do we get things where we need to get them? So patient safety was really, really critical to us. And it kind of led us on this journey where we are today about looking at questions for you all um, and how the impact of, 
of Covant has kind of changed your world. Um, so that was just kind of a high level, you know, flying in the sky view, but just know that it takes a lot because we, we really value making sure you guys are okay. So now we'll get to the polling question. So it is about safety. Um, and this is one, actually, it's funny. I asked my daughter the same question. So it comes up as, what is your preferred pandemic mask that makes you feel safe? So you're going to see on the screen a variety of different masks um, kind of choices. And as you think about those, um, you know, what is the one that you prefer? I know in our house, we like the cloth um, masks. They're not homemade. We did buy them, but we bought a lot in um, black so that we could actually paint and do some personalized designs on those. So in our household, that's what prefer. What a great yeah. idea. Yeah. To I love to decorate that. your own. Paula, now I want one. Yeah. I want one. I expect one shipped to me. <laughs> yep. No problem. We can do that. So for, I know there's a lot of other artists on the call too. Um, it, and one of the things that we did it for, for our younger friends or actually even, you know, my husband who is still out in the field as a first responder, we decorated the masks and it just, it helped people actually want to wear them more. And so that was something that we just did as our, our little kind of gift to everybody. So, so just curious what this, um, what kind of masks that the team of ICANN youth out there is comfortable with and, and what makes yeah, you it, feel safe. So um, I'm just looking at the, the poll results and we're getting diverse results, but for the most part, everyone likes the cloth homemade personalized masks with oh, the medical great. issued kind of coming in a close second along with the construction okay. style, like N95. Okay. Nobody seems so, to be just staying home and not wearing them. And that's actually, I'm, I'm glad to see that you all see yeah. a need for the mask. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I, I, I think, think that's, that's great. A, yeah, I think that's great too, because, um, you know, as we worked through the first several months of, of um, being on lockdown here um, with Chloe, we were okay for the first two to four weeks, right? It wasn't so bad. And then, then things started to be like, oh, my gosh, you just want to get out of the house, but how do you do it safely? safely? So for us, it's carrying hand sanitizer and masking up. And, and so I'm glad to hear that you all are comfortable. Yeah. Um, and there's some chat like happening, phone. too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Henry from Albania is saying he, <laughs> he likes the medical one. It makes him feel like a doctor. He's a doctor and he wants uh, to be a doctor. So that, that makes I love sense. that. Yeah. Yeah. Good and uh, I, I feel like one too. It brings me back to my nursing yeah. days and yeah. it makes me feel, feel great. Yeah. While Leanne uh, is ordering a baby Yoda mask, which I also love. Nice. <laughs> I but love, I, I, I love the ones that have like the big smiley face. I think those are great. I actually, I've been on the lookout for that one. So yeah. Yeah, what no, about yeah. from your healthcare providers? Do you want to see them not in the homemade mask? Like, is there a mask you prefer to see them wearing over? Um, uh, considering the selection we have in this poll, is there something different? And maybe fill in that in the chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will say I love Reese's answer that says I'm now matching, matching my mask to my outfit. You know what? I heard somewhere that there's like Gucci masks and everything yeah. like that now. I mean, this is going to become a staple and that that's not a bad thing at all. So um, I do love that. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So um, Gina, do we want to move to the next question? Yeah. So feel okay. free to continue chatting on this if you'd like. We'll move on to the next. I'll hand over to Deb for this one. Great. Thank you. So our next polling question, I'm going to make sure it's up already. Um, what is your biggest fear right now about COVID? So, you know, thinking about your, your own health safety, your family's health and safety, friends, um, you know, anything that uh, really addresses um, what your concerns are right now. So oh, the question just showed up. So um, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, understanding, you know, where the challenges are for you is going to be really critical as we're moving forward because, you know, this is going to set up the future and, and what, um, what changes will happen. And I think that's great. And I think that there's a lot of things, um, you know, 
being partial to psychology and mental health, um, you know, that's a question there too. So you can choose your number one. You can also um, choose a second one. So feel free to go ahead and, and put some second ones there in the, in the chat box. And we'll take a look at that. Yeah. So looking at the poll results, um, I, a lot of them are unknown of uh, the uncertainty of the situation and how long this will go on. Um, no school and impacting their education mm -hmm. is a biggie and their family's health. Mm -hmm. So no one has responded that they're concerned about their own health. And that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe tell us a little bit more about that in the chat. Why, why aren't you uh, as worried about your own health as your family's? Um, so re really interesting to see that, but I think the unknown uncertainty is weighing on us all, uh, um, adults or youth. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, think about also, you know, how your fears have changed. We've like, you know, like Paula has said, things have changed so much since March, April, it's just really evolving. And now we're in the summer months where, you know, you have had some time off from school or, um, you know, really gotten, it's gotten a little bit more ingrained. Maybe we're getting a little antsy and we want to leave our homes, you know, think about um, what, how your fears may have evolved from April till now. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's all changing for all of us. You know, and I love the we're all in this together because it truly is a global issue right now. And maybe we didn't touch on a fear that in this list. So feel free to add to the chat if there's something we missed that is weighing on you as a youth um, that adults just aren't even aware of or considering. For yeah, for I know that um, one that yeah, one that came up with my mom and dad the other day, they have a dog and they're very concerned because they have started seeing reports about animals with COVID, um, yeah. but they don't know about yeah. the transition. And, and their question to me was because for some reason, if I'm in clinical research, everybody calls me with questions <laughs> yeah. about COVID. They want to know like whether they should be believing the stories that are out there about can animals transmit, can they pass it, are they carriers? So there there's concerns for their pets because they love their pets just as much as their their, you know, people babies, their fur babies are super important too. So it was an interesting so, question that I hadn't heard before. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm just going to bring in Reese's chat because I think it's really important mm -hmm. because no, literally no one responded that they're worried about their own health. And Reese says, although she's in a high risk population, she fears that she's okay to rebound quick. It's her older relatives mm -hmm. that she's really concerned about. And mm -hmm. she's fearful for her loved ones more than anything. I think we all can yeah. relate to that Reese. And, but it's yeah. really interesting to hear since you are within this high risk population, but you guys yeah. care about each yeah. other more than yourselves. It's, it's uh, I yeah, love that. not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I have to say need. that's probably the top reason I, I wear my mask is to protect my parents and Chloe. So absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, oh. even the whole staying home, my, my mother, who's in the high risk category, you know, I, I make sure that she's staying home and I would wear a mask if I was by her. But I think the hard part for me is, she's far away from me too. So, you know, thinking about your family members that maybe don't live in the town that you're in or, or live in a different area, you know, when will we be able to see them again? I mean, that's, that's a concern that I think a lot of people have as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right. So we'll move on to our sure. next polling question, I think. Right. And it should pop up here soon. Um, but it has to do with healthcare experiences during the pandemic. Um, so when it does pop up, the question is, what have your doctors or care team done or changed due to the pandemic related to your routine, specialty maintenance, or ongoing care since the pandemic began? And there's quite a few choices on this poll when it shows up. <laughs> um, I know that there's a slight delay. But it, it, for us, again, you know, going back to what we were doing in, in Covance, um, what were we looking for to change and how could we best support? There are a number of things on this list that were important from our perspective about understanding, you know, when visits would be canceled, um, what couldn't be canceled, 
um, you know, we really needed to know kind of what was the most critical factor in order to um, make sure patients received what they needed. So, and that's in clinical research, but for you all just during, you know, your regular healthcare experience, what was it that either changed um, or, you know, basically what was the impact for you all during that time? And I'm not sure, Gina, I don't see the poll popping up in the polling window. I think it's just come up, so we should be getting, um, okay. there we go. yeah. All right. A little more of a delay than usual, but <laughs> so you guys to take a moment just to, um, just to select what was the biggest impact for you, then we'll wait and let that kind of uh, tally a little bit. And, and, and as you're in the that, yeah, go ahead, Gina. Well, in the chat, Maya was talking about she's worried about her grandpa he, he, who actually mm. has COVID and her other one mm. is high risk. So that that's a real, I mean, so Maya, we feel for you. That, that's yeah. just, it's really scary. And we hope the best for your yeah. grandpas. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's an, an interesting world to be in. You know, we all want to take care of everybody, but yet we have to do it from a distance and figure out how we can support each other. Um, you know, whether it's, I know um, on the prior session, someone was talking about watching videos together with friends via, you know, your mm -hmm. iPads and things like that. So it was very, very interesting, I think, to hear all of those perspectives um, and, and how you kept each other, you know, kept the, the mood up. And, um, you know, it's, just, uh, it's interesting and I think it forced us to be very innovative. So uh, yeah. I really... That's an interesting, interesting arena. So, you know, some of the things to think about um, maybe in the chat while we're waiting for the polls to kind of tally, um, we've had a lot of practices change, obviously, like our, even our day-to-day -day has changed. Everybody uses the term new normal. But what are things that we have put in place now that you think should stay even after the pandemic is over? Like, are there important changes that would be critical to keeping for our day-to-day -day, or that would just make sense, you know, um, such as giving every child the option to go to virtual learning if they have health challenges. Should that be an option all the time? And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting and then we'd love to hear a little bit more from you all about what would make sense to keep versus something we don't want to ever do again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what and I think practices Think yeah. And we heard the on the earlier session from some of you about some of the changes, especially with mm -hmm. um, the recent lung transplant and going virtual and um, canceled treatment plan. So we know there's more than one thing that has probably happened to some of you. So feel free to use the chat to input some of the most significant changes in your clinical care in uh, for um, your health and wellness that you've had over the last few months, as well as, um, as Paula said, things that should stay, that you'd like to stay. Mm -hmm. or would you rather do certain things in the virtual visit yeah. space or through telemedicine? So, I, I mean, I'll share a personal experience. I had, um, I actually thought I had COVID a couple months ago and had to go through the whole, um, telemedicine visit and get scheduled and get the test done. I did not. I was very fortunate. Um, but it was the first time I had actually used telemedicine. And it was very different. I mean, it was, you know, I could tell that, that the doctor was in their home. I was in my home. And, you know, it was, it was definitely a different experience. Um, and I think that it's, it's certainly um, a way to still get those feelings across um, and being able to talk to them. But it, it, was, it was definitely an adjustment personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing yeah, washing I'm just your hands. Some of the chat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm noticing the chats about how how clean things are and, and yeah. washing your hands. I mean, washing hands is something, you know, we teach from preschool on up, but yet for some reason doesn't stick like <laughs> saying your yeah. ABCs while you're washing your hands. I think right. that those are really interesting. I, and I do have to say, you know, I, I like the, the cleanliness aspect of where you go right now. And some places have the the clear like acrylic barriers. 
I personally think that's not such a bad idea. You know, it can just stop the spread of not just COVID-19, but any other infectious disease. And as we get into flu season, I actually like those. Um, so I like you know, Reese's comment about not having group bowls at parties for food where everyone puts yeah. their hand in the bowl. That is such, I came from an infectious disease background and that is a, a big deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Buffet food lines. I like that too. That's something That'd be else, good for you know, our like, waistline too. Yeah. To do buffets <laughs> yeah especially after COVID-19, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The waiting outside in the car, whether it's the doctor yeah. right? that year or getting your hair done or whatever, you know, waiting for a restaurant. I think that's actually a really good point too. So, oh, and having special times oh, for great. high risk uh, groups to go to the store, that's something maybe to mm -hmm. keep in mind. Or um, yeah. I, I think that's a great thing to keep around. And I'm going to yeah. remind, these are great. I, I love these responses and just remind everyone, we do have those Amazon Amazon gift cards to give away for yeah, for <laughs> and yeah. So and I think overall in. I think overall the cleanliness bit is something that is long overdue I mean you know we always talk about exposing ourselves to germs and all of that and of course we still want to build up our immunities but you know cleanliness is it's just it's such a basic idea so <laughs> I, I love that it's uh, being put in place but yeah these these answers are great yeah Awesome to see all the, the participation. Thank you, you guys. Yeah. All right, Deb, great. I'll pass it to you for question four. Fantastic. So I'm just going to see when that's going to come up. Um, <laughs> so this next question is, is really talking about um, information, um, pandemic information. You know, what has been really important to you um, as a – it, to help you get information about the pandemic, you know, um, some of the options are, you know, seeing where the cases are, hospital, hospitalization rates, um, testing plans. So, you know, really think about like what what are the key information that you found has been critical for you, and it may be different now than it was three months ago, and how that may have changed. So. Go ahead and pick one, um, and please, you know, continue to chat in our in our group chat here. Um, would like to hear that, um, you know, especially. And as you're thinking about this, think about you know concerns about information overload. You know, what is a positive and negative inf uh, feedback regarding getting all of that information? And uh, I see Isabella said, "What if all of the above <laughs> isn't a choice?" Isabella, go ahead yeah. and write in something. We'd love to hear it. So you know, yeah. please bring it on. I think that's great. So, I, um, but yeah, you're right. I think this, um, I yep. think sometimes we get a lot of information. Go ahead, Gina. Oh, I was going to say I, this is going to be interesting to see too how it changes. So we're seeing in the mm -hmm. in the polling that impact on school is big and that may be due mm -hmm. also the time of year we're in we're in we're all anxious to know what the school districts are deciding and what the states and countries are deciding for school um and that's really big deal for parents and for youth so um that's the number one answer along with the case counts which yeah. kind of goes into the school answer i think um, mm -hmm. I, there's really minimal responses to treatment options and nobody's interested in clinical trial participation. I'm interested a little bit more to hear about that. <laughs> Why I, do yeah. you think your mind will change over time? Do you want to be part of the trials for vaccines or treatment options? If you were to undergo, uh, come down with COVID-19, um, that you guys are clinical trial minded kids. So it, um, that's interesting that, that that's not a um, necessarily a response at this time. It may just be the timing, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we've had a lot of discussion in the news about antibody testing and, and yeah. um, donating, you know, so that they can use that down the line. I'd be curious if that kind of clinical trial would be interesting to you all as well, especially since some of you are already, um, you know, kind of in the higher risk category. Um, you know, what, what would you participate in if it were made available? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mary Elizabeth, she's with our new chapter in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And she said she definitely would um, be a part. Her concern right now, though, 
Um, but it's not a concern right now because she doesn't have COVID. Um, mm-hmm. And she's probably practicing yeah. safe, safe distancing and, right. and uh, hygiene yep. and everything. Which is wonderful. So thinking about, you know, we, we talk a lot about vaccines as well. So what about a vaccine trial? So don't just think about if you're positive mm-hmm. for COVID, but think about, you know, vaccine trials, if they come your way, would that be something that you would be concerned about participating in? Um, or would that be something that you might want to do? So I think that that, you know, it's, it's again, it's a, a new area, area. Oh, mm-hmm. I like that. Anything, anything is better than nothing. That's right, Reese. Yeah. So, you uh-huh. know, whatever. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's obviously a lot of work going on. You know, we've seen that in the last few months. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, John a has a great question for everyone in the chat <laughs> yeah. has, anyone in ICANN actually been diagnosed with COVID-19 and, or uh, I think we know from Maya that her grandpa has it right now, but um, Mm. it would be interesting that perspective as well. Yeah. Ooh, I like, I like um, the, I would be part of a vaccine if it didn't clash with school. That's a really good point. You know, thinking about the fact that, you know, whether, so that you're not taking time away. And that's, that's really important to, to have them scheduled at a time that's convenient for you. I think that's a great, I, great point. So I yeah. uh, will say a little personal story. So this is the second pandemic I've gone through as a nurse and study at being involved with research. And the first one was swine flu, H1N1, back in the mid-2000s. Okay. And I was actually working at Children's Mercy Hospital at that time and managed that clinical trial work for that vaccine. And we had 160 kids enrolled in one week in the vaccine trial. And most of the kids came to it, came to their parents saying they wanted to be in the trial. It was amazing. And we did do it so that it was afternoon, evening appointments and weekend appointments only because we didn't want it to uh, get in the way of school. And it was a critical piece of being able to successfully and quickly enroll that trial. So we know school's important and we don't want to take away anything from your schooling, even if it's virtual schooling. Um, But great point. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. We're going to move on to our next yeah. Our last polling question, I think. Okay, so yeah. this is about, um, you'll see it come up in, in just a minute, hopefully. Um, but this is around where you get your information from. So not specifically the, the information it is, but how you like to get your information. So what is your main source for getting information on COVID-19? And we're interest about, interested in this because it, it it's important that we do get information out to all the sources that are important um, and that they're easily accessible for people. So um, when you think about, you know, what's your go-to thing? I know for me, when we first started um, looking at case counts and everything here in the U.S., I would go to the John Hopkins dashboard like every single morning. I logged onto that and then Coronavirus Ohio when it was launched. So you know, I just do a quick run through and because for me, it was one source to see what was kind of going on globally. Um, so very interested to hear what types of sources you all use. Um, and again, if it's more than one, put your, you know, your other choices in the chat as well. Um, but we're just really curious to see because you are such a, a technically engaged um, age range and, and you know, not being in school, of like, how did you find that information? So, so, so some of the early our early responses back, we're we're seeing a lot of people are are getting their information online, um, and that's to be expected. Mm-hmm. Um, w- maybe in the chat mm-hmm. box, you can fill in what your online sources are. You like where you go? Is it social media? Mm-hmm. Is it a specific news outlet or a specific website? We'd love to hear more about that. Um, their parents, their TV and streaming services, and then uh, mm-hmm. teachers in school. I think now that we're in summertime, maybe that's happening a little less. Well, summertime in some parts of the world. Um, yeah. But I wonder how that impacted you. Has that changed from 
early COVID-19 19 pandemic when the school was still in session to now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's another thing. Feel free to speak about. And Addie's saying yeah. um, New York Times. She goes to the New York Times. Nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to know, I think, as a little aside here as well, you know, we have friends on here. Do you talk about it with your friends or do you try to avoid the conversation? I know that um, very often I, you know, I mean, I, I, we live and breathe it a lot some days when we're here at work, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I, my 17 year old daughter says, can we just talk about something else? You know? So, um, you know, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that it's, you know, talked about way too much? Should we focus on something else for a while or, you know, yeah. Yeah. The overload. Oh, the CDC too. Actually, yeah. A little bit of overload. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Oh, the CDC. Good. NPR, yep. CNN, mm -hmm. their parents. Do they get information from their parents. Good. Oh, great. Cool. <laughs> um, I'm just so yeah. writing, guys, it's sometimes hard right. to tell which news source is the most trustworthy, but I listen to both our yeah. local news sources and the national nighttime news. I use my parents when I have questions. And then Scott said yeah. Apple News sends him a summary email with articles covering many yeah. topics every morning, which he finds interesting. Um, yeah, I know um, my family, which you'll never guess from my accent, but I'm actually from the UK. So um, I tap into news sources that are launched like the BBC or my dad's into the Daily Mail UK. And I, I do the same thing. I'll cross reference those with US sources just to see if there's data that might be different or, you know, a trusted source within all of them. So it's um, really interesting in a global global pandemic um, to have so many information sources and, and to be able to filter through them. And Matali just posted that, you know, they talk to their friends about COVID in terms of school reopening, which I think makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. and that is great. It, um, way yeah. to bounce off what how you're feeling about it as well. Um, and then Mary Elizabeth chimed in that um, popular articles on social media, she'll go and read. Mm. And it, which social media outlet is, is your yeah. preference? Is a follow up question. Awesome. Yeah, and I think even now with you know, school starting up again, too, you know, that is a big concern, because it's just continuing. And I think, um, you know, when it was back in March or April, we were thinking, oh, it'll be all done by summer, or it'll right. be done by July, or, you know, whatever. And here we are, it's July. And, you know, we're still yeah. talking about it. We're still yeah. talking about it globally. So, so yeah, one yeah. other interesting thing that we we met with the youth advisors before about this mm -hmm. workshop, and this same, um, we we kind of, this is how we kind of formulated our questions and it was really helpful. Um, but some of this discussion around your source of information, it was interesting to us. And it, it, the polling also shows the same response. Nobody is going to their healthcare provider for information about COVID-19. Um, so why is that? Why aren't you going to your doctors and nurses? Why do you, um, have you not had contact with them or are, are you seeing other sources being more reliable, being more up to date with the information? But um, this is now, uh, this, this is the second time that no one chose healthcare provider or mentioned it. Um, so that, that's really kind of interesting for a health pandemic, a health mm -hmm. uh, problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And Reese followed up that she talks to her friends about the pandemic. It helps her digest the information. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I see the Instagram as a social media choice. And uh, that's, that's probably the one that I use the most, but only because my 15 year old yeah. taught me how to use it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gamal is saying he feels that um, I'm, I'm going to assume it's your healthcare provider is too busy. Um, mm. 
to speak, or maybe that's meant for a parent. I'm not sure, but I would assume the healthcare provider. Yeah, and we did hear that a lot about um, healthcare teams, especially in the hospital settings, being redeployed to other areas during the the pandemic. So other clinics might have been shut down, and they may. You're right; they may not have been available. So that's that's a good um, a good perspective. He followed up yeah. with, uh, it's easy to look things up online or ask mm-hmm. in nearby people. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Mary sense. Short asked a, a question. Do you think youth representatives should be included in Covance task force as decisions related to schools have a big impact on youth? I certainly think they should Absolutely. be. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I do too. I do too. Yep. Yeah. I know our school district yep. actually did survey not only us as parents, but they surveyed the kids as well, which was really good to see. And, and there right. was a lot in the survey about um, your mental health and well-being, not just your, your academic um, focus, but how are you doing? Do you feel school is needed not mm-hmm. only for learning, but to help support you um, and to avoid depression and, and anxiety and things like that? So it was good to see that come from the school district. Yeah. And some yeah. of the other yeah. responses around healthcare providers is about um, that it is about access to them and ease of getting information and that things are changing so quickly. It's a lot easier to go mm-hmm. online um, and especially with the changes happening so quickly. So great. Feel free to continue on the chat. We've, we've moved on to our closing comments because we're nearing the end of, of day four. So, Deb, I'll let you close out our session. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was so great, so helpful, um, and just really interesting. You guys have great views, and, um, you know, we really love hearing them. So, we just want to kind of tell you what we want to do as a part of the next step. So, any of your responses that we've given, yes, we will review them for those fantastic gift cards. So, um, you know, keep an eye out. You might be getting one. Um, but we're going to take a look at your responses because it's really important to us. You know, we're all in research and we want to have this, this voice. And what we can do is then anonymously share your voice and your feedback um, with the companies that we're working with so that they understand as they're planning for clinical trials, we have some support from your community. Um, we're also going to talk to youth advisors, um, probably have some um, follow-up questions for them as well. But what's going to be really great and that you're all going to be involved in is we're going to generate a survey and it's to um, get some more perspectives from from you as a community, both um, from the youth perspective as well as your parents' perspective. So expect that to come. Keep an eye out. That will be coming from us. And then once we've collected all of that information, we will share it back to you. So um, definitely something we, we love hearing your voices. We love getting your feedback. You're critical to research, you know, and, and we really look, um, look to you to help guide us um, as we make next steps in not only COVID, but in any of the disease states that we're working in. Um, so we really want to thank you for your time today. And we're just going to reiterate what you all hear and what you all even said. Please continue to be safe and well. Please practice social distancing. Wear your mask. Please, please, please wear your mask and make sure you're washing your hands. So thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. We really do appreciate your time today. This has been fantastic. Thanks. Thank you, you guys. Thank you.